History happened everywhere. A random country, a random time, and a topic pulled from the hat. Then a week for one of us to go away and find out all that we can, then come back and reveal all to the other. You're listening to... History happened everywhere. Hello and welcome to History Happened Everywhere. I'm Ryan Weir and with me in the studio is the very lovely Mr Peter Goddard. I'm here and lovely, as you say. You are. All right, Peter, I've got a question for you. Go on. History Happened Everywhere. The movie. Who plays you? Well, I mean, the challenge is to find someone sufficiently handsome. Yeah. uh, But also who looks like they would... Drag through a hedge backwards. (laughs) (laughs) It's that combination of charm and exhaustion that is really difficult to capture. I think probably... Al Pacino. No. Toby Maguire. Toby Maguire? Yeah. He looks about four still. <laughs> I'm going to take Dustin Hoffman. Uh, Dustin Hoffman back in the day? No, or Dustin, Hoffman Dustin Hoffman now. Dustin Hoffman. Okay. Who's going to be you? Well, you can cast me. I think I'm going to cast Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy? Tom Hardy. Wow. Okay, I thought you were going like Cher LaBeouf or something. No, I'm saying Tom Hardy, you were a hulking physical presence. And I mumble a lot. (laughs) (laughs) History Happened Everywhere, the movie, right? It starts, picture this, the movie begins, the curtains pull back. Is that what they do in movies these days? (laughs) And the usherette comes out. The carton of cigarettes for everyone. (laughs) When did you last go to the Lucky Strikes? <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. OK, so we've seen the B-film and the news footage. And the cartoon. Yeah, and the cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the A-film starts. All right. Right. <laughs> and it's History Happened Everywhere, the movie. Yeah. So we've probably got, like, RKO Pictures presents History Happened Everywhere, the movie. And then you come on and you're a detective. Right? There's been a crime in history, and you have to. You've got a, a fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a fortnight to hunt down the clues as to the crime as that, to happened, the crime that happened in history, ah. and then you've got to come back and tell me all about it because I'm the judge. I see. I had it down as a sort of Bill and Ted thing where you and I scampered around history to random places, random times, because the time machine dials have got stuck. And so we keep randomly finding ourselves in places. We get stuck in the Dursley. Right. It's like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. <gasps> we hit the Durs later, but we hit the wrong combination of it. Or it gets stuck, gets and stuck. so I hit it again. You spill your coffee in the Durs later. I don't drink coffee. Shh, fritz, fritz, fritz. I don't drink coffee. Well, that's why you knocked it over, because I bought it for you. And you're like, damn it, I don't drink coffee. I hate coffee. Yeah, I do get angry with you. Right. So that makes sense. So then you smash the cup, and then bush, there's coffee all over the Durs later. Fritzy, fritzy, fritz. Yeah. Random country, random time. That's good. And at some point, right, because we keep hopping around, right, because there's no point just going to one place, right? It keeps on randomising, it keeps on sending us, whoa, where are we now? We're in, I don't know, Paraguay. And... Ironically, because we don't know about anything about the places we visit, we yeah. are in a terrible position to do well in these things. good. Whoa, what are you doing? History, dude! Oh, hang on, I hear a knocking. I think it's Hollywood executives. <laughs> yeah, quite right too. <laughs> I'm excited about this. I'm going to write a first draft. I'm going to call my agent. No, I'm going to get an agent. <laughs> yeah, you should get, I was just going to say you should get an agent first. Okay, so, Peter, like, why don't we remind ourselves of what you're going to be talking about this week? All right, let's check it out. Uh, let's hit that rewind button. It's my rewind noise. Yeah, I added that in. You don't need to do that. So I'm very excited to see what uh, my task for next week is. So why don't we fire up the Durs later? Okay, the Durs later is fired up and uh, all pistons are pumping, all 
spark plugs are sparking. It's Your good to go. Capacitor is go. Right, so what is my country, Ryan? Your country, Pete, is Uruguay. Uruguay, okay. <laughs> uh, right, when are we talking about then? 1776 to present. This is our free America period. So this is America independence. 1776 to 2000. Now. What year are we? <laughs> 21. It did change recently in your defense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, there you go. All right. That's exciting. That's a good range. I'm sure I can find something interesting there. And your topic is death. Death. Oh, wow. Well, uh, that is, that's pretty open. I'm excited about that. I'm hoping it could bring you next week some rocking death facts. <laughs> So, Uruguay, 1776 to the present day, and death. Yep, that's a long, old time period I got there, so I think I've uh, found a way to cover it off. Death, fortunately, or unfortunately, comes to us all, so <laughs> relatively easy to crowbar in. Right, but you said Uruguay, I, I noticed there. Did I? You've gone with this Spanish pronunciation. Ah, right, okay. So, is that how I've been pronouncing it? That sounds a good thing. Yeah, I think so. I think, um, to be honest with you, I, I did the old... Uh, YouTube, you know, they have those how to pronounce words things. Yeah. And once again, it came back with about five different versions okay. uh, from Uruguay from a Spanish point of view. Yeah. That's in Spanish language, that is. To Uruguay, to Uruguay. Uruguay. Uh, well, that was the very American one that I found. So th nothing definitive came across, but I think Uruguay is probably the more Spanish -y way to do it. Okay. Let's go with that. All right. Let's do it. Now, uh, it is the Oriental Republic of Uruguay. Wait. What? The Oriental Republic of Uruguay. Uh, so Orient it actually means east, right? So we, we in the middle of the map, as the map's designed around our lines, see the China area as the Orient because it is east of us. Yes, but the uh, Americas are to the west. They are to the west of us. But the Republic of Uruguay, which we'll come into later, was originally attached to a much larger thing, which include Argentina, of which it was the eastern province. Oh, Okay. So, right, so from what their perspective, it is the eastern... They're the eastern part of what they were once attached to, yes. Wow, okay. Well, that's cool. I like that name. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Um, Normally, it's sort of the Republic of, or the Peoples, this, that, and the other. But yeah, but that's, that's the, the first, first time, of, yeah. this first Oriental we've come across, isn't it? I like it. Um, so we're in South America, just to orient us. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> about halfway down on the right by the sea, so this is coastal. It borders Argentina to the west and southwest. So okay. Buenos Aires is just sort of across the river. It's the whole country is kind of north of the River Plata, the Rio de la Plata, which is the Silver River, or sometimes the River Plate it's translated as. Okay. So that river goes between Uruguay and Argentina. Right. And to the north of Uruguay is Brazil. Is it a big river? Oh, yes, massive. Okay. And it kind of goes into the sort of wide, not delta, what do you call it, estuary kind of thing. So it's this really broad... It looks like a bite almost taken out of the side of South America. Cool. But but what's interesting is Argentina and Brazil, as you probably know, are enormous countries. Whereas I didn't know that. Uruguay is not. Is it not? No, no. So Uruguay is about 176,000 square kilometers. What's um, that in a France? In a France, it is about a third of a France. One third of a France? One third of a France. That is tiny. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and in people terms, also pretty thin. There's three and a half million people there. Whereas in France, there are 67 million people. Wow. So... I mean, three times as big, but 20 times as many people. That's kind of the population sparsity you're looking at around here. My understanding of Uruguay, and I'm probably entirely wrong because I know next to nothing about it other than the football team, is cowboys, fields. Well, yeah, that's about it. Gauchos, which uh, we're going to come across. The, gauchos. Uh, the South American cowboys, yeah. Okay. And partly that is because of the all three and a half million people, nearly two million of them, 1.8 million, live in Montevideo, the capital. Cool. So basically half of the people of three and a half million leaves you a million and a half or so. Yeah. The whole rest of the country. That's pretty thin population. Okay. Uh, it's the second smallest country in South America. Second smallest. Yeah, I mean, it's not like Monaco or it's not like these micro states we're talking about. This is a not a not small country. A third of our France is still pretty tasty. Mm. But the, the the thing is, Argentina and Brazil are absolutely enormous. Yeah, huge place. And uh, so, yeah, it's slightly bigger than Suriname, which is the smallest South American country. Okay. Uh, it's lush, green, fertile, rolling plains and lowlands which is where your cowboys are roaming across looking yep. after the cows. Bit of forest and jungle around the place, but yeah, it's good for grazing and stuff like that. So that's where we're at. Bit of jungle, bit of greenery, 
relatively small, sandwiched between these two gigantic countries. Um, Flat? Mountainous? Sort of rolling hills. No, not mountains to that speak of. Good. I just yeah, like the way you said that. Rolling hills. Mm. Lush rolling It's like you're hills. trying to sell me property there. Uh, I have a very good uh, <laughs> swamp I could sell you. <laughs> <laughs> Some famous Uruguayan things, uh, Luis Suarez. Yeah, footballer. Yeah. Um, and basically, I, I did a quick Google, as one does, of famous Uruguayans, and it essentially is like a thousand footballers yeah. uh, who I hadn't heard of. But I guess they're good, really good at football they're down very there good in at that football, area. Yeah. Which does make sense, because in 1930, they did host the first World Cup. Oh, okay. And the they first won one. Yeah. Some other things for you. Some wine. It's a wine country. It's the fifth largest producer of wine in south america which doesn't sound that impressive except of course you think of its relative size but there's a wine that i read about called tanat apparently kind of arrivals a malbec okay so if you're a malbec drinker give a tanat a go i'll drink a malbec i like a malbec here's a port a place in uruguay that you may have heard of yeah but don't realize you've heard of frey bentos no way frey bentos is a port town in uruguay which was where they packed and shipped off all the meat. So uh, for those people that don't know what Frey Bantos is, it's a tinned pie, right? It, so it's, they, it's at this time, it was a... the corned beef. There was corned beef particularly that they were about. So, but that's what Frey Bantos are famous for, right? The pies? No? I would have said corned beef myself, but You'd they also do beef. pies. <laughs> like, there's no one else doing tinned pies. Like true. meat, Like a meat sauce with a pastry on top. I don't you could have ever had one. Actually. You could have brought a Frey Bentos in. We oh could have sat Lord. here and eaten a little pie. That sounds terrible. <laughs> I don't even know how you cook it. But you cook it in the tin, I guess. I guess. Do you steam it? Yeah, probably, right? It just cooks within the tin. Mm-mm. <laughs> well, I did not bring you any corned beef or any tinned pies, I'm afraid, because I'm talking about death. You are. So uh, that is my really whistle-stop tour of where it is and what it is. Uh, okay. Now, normally I would tell you about the time, but this time period we're talking about is so vast. It's from the American Revolution, 1776, through to today. So mm. I could spend another 45 minutes just describing things that happened in that period, but I'm going to trust people have some idea of what went on. Yeah, this is our American freedom time period, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So this is Radio Free America, if you will, from mm. 1776, the signing of the Declaration of the Independence, to now, where it is still uh, a free place, I'm told. Allegedly. <laughs> Uh, but the subject is death. So what I'm going to try and do, and you can be the judge of how successful it <laughs> okay. is, is give you the history of Uruguay in five deaths. Yeah, great. I'll take it. We're going to start with death number one, the death of Juan Diaz de Solis, which I've entitled How to End Your Expedition on a Dramatic Note. Death in Uruguay. Number one. How to end your expedition on a dramatic note. So Juan Diaz de Solis was the first European explorer to land in Uruguay that we know of. Where is he from? I'm glad you asked that. We're not quite sure. Uh, he may have been Portuguese. He may have been Spanish. We're not exactly clear. Portuguese. Some people think he was. Yeah. Some people think he was uh, born in Seville. Some people think he was born in Portugal. Why is he such a mystery? Like, that's in of itself a mystery, is that he is a mystery. Well, they didn't have great record keeping back in the day, did they? But, no, uh, but come on, everybody knows the story of, like, explorer, the first explorers and he founded countries and stuff. Well, true. And he was quite a, a notable guy in that uh, he, he did... We do know that he began his naval career in Portugal. So he changed okay. his name slightly to... Joao Diaz de Solis, a bit of a name change. Became a privateer in the French fleets for a bit. Does that mean pirate? Yes. Okay. It's a, pri- it's a pirate that's got a letter from their government saying, he's not a pirate, it's okay. Oh, okay. So you're hired by your government or your royalty to go out and take Harass, stuff. Harass the enemy. Yeah, exactly. the enemy. Yeah, okay, it's a cool. sort of licensed pirate, basically. Nice. Uh, but then he serves the Spanish crown later. This guy changed sides a lot, it looks like, which is, as far as I can make out, pretty common in this uh, era. So he became a pilot major of Spain in 1512. Uh, which was after the death of Amerigo Vespucci, who you may have heard of. No. Nope. Have you heard of the country that was named after him? Vespucci? America. <laughs> what? America was named after Amerigo Vespucci. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. Really? Yeah. Amerigo Vespucci. 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 Yeah. I've never heard of that name. Really? Nope. 
Oh, right. I thought that was common knowledge. Okay, so no. I was d- delightfully informing you that Amerigo Vespucci was an explorer who had the theory that where Columbus landed wasn't India at all and was, in fact, its own country. Okay. And consequently, America was named after Amerigo Vespucci. Well, I did not know that. Well, anyway, he died and he was replaced by uh, our man Juan Diaz de Solis, who was then later commissioned to update the Padron Real. Oh, what's that mean? Well, the Padron Real is a map. It's the master map in Spain. Okay. Uh, all returning ships who were out exploring, because yeah. it's the era of exploration, had to, by law, report back to this organization, the Casa de Contratación in Seville. Right. And say, right, this is where I went. This is what I found. Here's the latitudes and longitudes of the places that I discovered. Okay. And they would take this information and update the master map. This is the Padron Real. Nice. Uh, the and father then, map, Padron. I, I think Padron probably means map. Real, I think, is royal. Oh. Uh, but the pilots then would, the, the people in the Casa de Contratación, would plot the new information on the map. And then when a new set of ship is headed out from port, they go, hey, before you go, here's a copy of the latest version of the map. Right. Uh, and off they went. And there's no photocopying in those days. Someone's sitting Someone's down and just drawing, drawing a, a lot of coastline. Yep. No, that's interesting, isn't it? Because you don't think about these people like, when they get back home from their exploring, oftentimes much of the stories that we hear about them is them discovering new peoples or new lands, not the boring admin bit when they get back. Right, update the master map. Like, yeah. well, now we know where this place is. Brilliant. And, there must have, the and there must have been examples where they there were people that hadn't discovered anything but couldn't say that, and so they just had to make stuff up. Well, I guess the other other people who go, oh, I didn't find that, I suppose there must yeah, be some years of, later, right? Someone else. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, this was a bit of a, a side trip. I just thought that notion of the Padron Real was quite interesting. Um, Not just that, that America was named after someone. I, that astonishes me that you didn't know that, so I'm shocked. But Juan Diaz is, is still going. He's, he's, this is a job he has for a while, but then he sets out for South America on a new journey, cool. presumably because he wants to you know, draw a bit more of the map. Yeah. So he sets off in 1515, end of the, end of the year. The 1516, he's down in South America following the coast downwards until he gets to the mouth of Rio de la Plata. Rio de la Plata is a really important, almost a character in everything we're going to talk about. Okay. It's the river that sits between Uruguay and Argentina, just to remind you. Yep. Uh, and he sails up river. Uh, he gets up to a co- the point where he reaches the meeting point of two rivers, the Uruguay and the Parana. And there he meets the locals. So in pre-colonial times, Uruguayan territory had a couple of tribes, particularly notable the Charua and the Guarani peoples. There were probably only ten or 20,000 of them, so just little tribes doing hunter-gathering kind of things. So our man runs into the locals and they kill him. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, then they eat him. Oh, they eat him. They kill him and eat him. And uh, his men or just him? Uh, some of his men. The others watch this and um, make a <laughs> something of a quick <laughs> getaway, I would imagine. But there is some challenge here. This is recorded as having been the Charua people okay. who attacked and killed him. But that they did not, as far as we know, practice cannibalism, but the Guarani people right. did. So there is some suspicion that this report that the Charua killed him yeah. isn't really true. It was the Guarani who did it. Bit of a mystery for you. Unless the Charua, they ate them anyway as a means to be able to lay blame on the other tribe. You're going black flag on this. <laughs> <laughs> you immediately go straight to the conspiracy <laughs> theory. Even in 1500s <laughs> Uruguay. They're like, you're like mm. we can totally screw over those other guys, the Guaranis. If we just eat, all we have to do is eat this one guy. Come on, guys. We They'll can eat it. one person. We'll be in the clear. Well, it clearly didn't work because Chiroa get reported everywhere as having been the people who killed him. Oh, no. Oh, no, that sucks. There's it? only one place I found that mentioned this uh, element of eating, suggesting it might not have been them. Mm. But you will come across the Chiroa people again in the near future. If you had to eat somebody, what, what would you start with? Like, yep, free choice on what part of the body? Probably the thigh. Because I feel like it's the least, it's quite an inoffensive body part. You didn't think body very part. long about that. You were... Straight in with your answer. I've thought about this a lot because there's a whole piece that isn't we aren't going to talk about, which relates to cannibalism in a situation where some guys... So I'll really quickly go into it. I don't know if you remember the film Alive. A plane yeah. from Uruguay crashes. Yeah, horrible. And the oh, guys survive Uruguay. by... They didn't crash in Uruguay, but it was a Uruguayan plane. Yeah, no, no, that's sorry. That's people. what I meant. Yeah. So They crashed in the Himalayas or something? In the Andes. Andes, okay. And they were forced to eat each other the dead people the people who are already dead to survive yeah so as it happens i have actually thought about this quite a lot i'd be okay week. with that 
Yeah, I'm I was absolutely that. fine with it. I'm not they, killing someone to eat them, but like if they're dead already, they're just lying around. But they, a lot of them were, they were Catholic. They had real problems with sort of reconciling what they were going to do. And they eventually mm. came to a kind of reconciliation with what they were doing through a perception of it as the kind of host, the, the eating of Jesus's body as validating what they were doing. Yeah. I helping mean, each other survive. That's something that you can apply after the fact, isn't it? You're starving up on a... Oh, no, they had to convince there was the last holdout who hadn't eaten anybody... Mm. That that's how they convinced her to to survive essentially. Right. So sorry, that was a huge diversion. But um, our man Juan Diaz de Solis dies, gets eaten, and that is pretty much it for the Europeans for quite a long time. Perhaps unsurprisingly, <laughs> well, they don't go back. You'd think that they there would be some sort of retribution or something. That's part of exploring, isn't it? They're, loads of them get killed by natives, and that's just the end of the story. Oh, okay. I so, suppose if there's no gold or something. Exactly. There's not a lot here at this point. But this brings us to death number two. Okay. Death number two is the death of Jose Gervasio Artigas. Gervasio. Gervasio, yes, I know. It's very difficult not to think of Ricky. When Ricky you're, Gervasio. Um... <laughs> but yeah, Jose Gervasio Artigas. Uh, I'm, I'm going to entitle this chapter, How to Keep Travelling After You're Dead. Death in Uruguay, number two. How to keep travelling even after you're dead. Jose Gervasio Artigas is a national hero of Uruguay, sometimes called the father of Uruguayan nationhood. Okay. He was born in Montevideo in 1764. He was born to wealthy parents, but he didn't like the life, so he runs off at the age of 12 to work on the family farm. They were much older than that 12. Though, they were, they? yeah. He was like a strapping a 12, fella. <laughs> at 12, I was on my skateboard and playing Lego. Like, I, there wasn't any plans to escape Uruguay. Yeah, this guy was uh, ahead, of the, ahead of the game when it comes to growing up. I suppose they all were at that time, weren't they? I guess so. So anyway, he distanced himself from his parents. He didn't like that life, I guess. And he becomes involved in cattle smuggling. Mm. Cows reappear. How do you smuggle a cow? It's just a uh, big coat yeah, Really big coat. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so a reward is put out for his death. Okay, at 12? Uh, no, no, he's come of age now. He okay. must be probably 18, 20 maybe. Right. Oh, I don't know exactly, but young. So, but the, then there's the Anglo-Spanish War kicks off. So what's happening over in Europe is Napoleon's happening. Okay. Uh, and there's loads of people changing sides. And Spain is first against Napoleon, then they join Napoleon, then against Napoleon again. So it's all quite confusing. Uh, but the important thing to know is the British, because they're at war with the Spanish at this particular moment... Uh, in 1806, they attack Banda Oriental just as a sort of side gig on the Napoleonic War. Right, OK. So 1806 and 1807, there's a second force, a second time the British come again and they siege Montevideo and they hang around there for months and months and months. So the British are basically bothering our pre-Uruguay place called a Banda Oriental at this time. Mm. I don't know if I should feel patriotic or not. I, I, I feel pretty neutral about this one, to be honest with you. OK. Uh, but... The result of this is the, the Artigas' family negotiate a pardon for him. So forget the cattle thing. We've got bigger fish to fry. We've got the British here. On, account, on the condition that he creates a battalion of people and joins the, the war. Right. So he's pretty successful. He runs a bit of a, a guerrilla activity against the British. Gorillas uh, and cows. <laughs> <laughs> well, the cows, the gorillas ride the cows into battle, right? I mean, I, don't know, I would be terrified. How did by you that. not get this in your school textbooks? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, the other gorilla, unfortunately, that would have been awesome if a bunch of uh, apes came barreling out of the woods, uh, riding like cows. That apes. would be amazing. <laughs> but no, so the, the British uh, leave. He, he, he's quite successful, but didn't really beat them because the British leave because the Spanish change sides again. Uh, and then the British find themselves allies of the Spanish. So they go, oh, probably shouldn't be invading your territory. Let's leave. But this in and of itself is a sort of small thing, but it does have a legacy because there are people called the Criollos. Uh, these are people who were born in the New World, but of Spanish descent. So not native, not slaves. European descendants, but born in South America. Okay, Criolas. Criolos. 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 Okay. Criolos. Uh, so they, they basically... Is that name still in existence? I don't know. I've only come across it. I'll have to look into that. I mean, the only word that I know is similar is Creole, right? Yeah, I wondered that. I thought that as well. I wondered if it's something similar. Which is... Where is where am I thinking of Creole? Louisiana. Louisiana, New Orleans. Did I say that right? Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> New Orleans. New Orleans. <laughs> oh dear. Right, so moving on. So those guys 
a bit like our friends from the episode about Mozambique. You're a Criollo. You're, again, prohibited from having certain positions. You're second-class citizen, essentially. You're better than a native, but you're not as good as a proper European. Uh, but they realise that they've kicked out the British, or at least done well in kicking them out, without any Spanish help at all. So this is the beginning of sowing the seeds of, actually, do we need Spain at all? The Enlightenment's happening in Europe, so these ideas of like independence start to be uh, fermenting in this area. So in 1810, there's the May Revolution in Rio de la Plata. Sounds fun. Remember that Rio de la Plata is still at this time Argentina and Uruguay. Mm -hmm. Uruguay being the Banda Oriental region within Rio de la Plata. So the May Revolution basically says we don't need the Spanish. We'll become self-governing in our own way. Uh, Spain is not uh, delighted with this at all. Declares Buenos Aires, which is where this originates, a rogue city, uh, and says Montevideo is the new capital. We're still in charge. We're going to have this out, basically. A rogue city. A rogue city. Right? I'd love to be a rogue city. Right? Just live, in a, that, Croydon. Just live in a rogue city. Croydon is a rogue city. Mm. Well, we're halfway there. Well, we are. <laughs> I think arguably it's already there. Yeah, we're rogue in the sort of broke sense, though. <laughs> yeah, brogue city. So anyway, Artigas, our chap who's been fighting the, the British, right. he's on the side of free Rio de la Plata. So he doesn't like the Spanish. He faces the forces, forces who are in Montevideo. Uh, and he has a fight in what is called the Battle of Las Piedras, the Stones. And he basically beats the... Wait, the Battle of the Stones? Of Las Piedras, yeah. Oh. I just imagine Las Piedras is a place, but it oh, translates okay. as right. the Stones. Right. But the interesting part about this is, this is quite a significant battle in the terms of the, the region's fortunes. Okay. But it's him with an army of a thousand men, and the enemy had 1,230 men, of which 200 defected Artigas in the middle of the battle. So that's a tiny battle, really. Compare mm-hmm. this. This is about the same time as Waterloo. Mm-hmm. So Waterloo was 1815, and we're talking about, uh, I think, 1812-ish, I think. Artigas had a thousand men. Napoleon had a hundred thousand men in the Battle right. of Waterloo. So... You're really seeing this sort of regional thing playing out with reasonably small numbers of people. Yeah, it's a skirmish rather than like a proper full-on war, right? right? And this, all of this stuff that I'm talking about, you know, the scale of it is relatively small. We see the enemy approaching. Soon now, we will meet them face to face. I am resolved to live or die amongst you all. A day may come when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship, but it is not this day. They shall not pass. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, we will not vanish without a fight. We are going to live on. We are going to survive. We shall fight them on the beaches. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. Yeah, yeah, nice one. All right, yeah, that was a that was a good speech. Did did you write that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is this it then? Is it um, just you and me? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Dave said he was definitely coming, so I, I don't know if you want to maybe wait a bit. But we have had apologies from Colin. Oh, all oh, right. Well, um, well, they are kind of waiting. So should we just? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Take heart, lads. For God is with us, and we outnumber them two to one. Glory awaits! Onward to victory! Charge! Charge! Now! Victory is ours! Yay! Uh, But anyway, the good news is for Artigas, he wins, yay. Starts to siege Montevideo, which gets sieged a lot, I've noticed. Really? The number of sieges of Montevideo are just remarkable. It's, does it have anything there that's worthwhile, or is it just... Um, it's a port, so it's a oh, it's, it's the on the, the edge of the river. It's a port before. If you drive down the Plata River, hmm. it's the first port on the right. If you go further down, you get Buenos Aires on the left. So it's quite an important commercial centre. Hold that. You hold the area. Yeah, because you've got logistics. You've got all your supplies can come in. Cool. So um, I'm imagining cannon fire there, there and was, muskets. Yeah, and naval battles happening this time as the forces have a lot of seafaring, obviously, yeah. objectives. Sieging the, the city involves partly keeping the sea part. But during uh, this war, free. right? Like we're, we're talking rifles in 1815? Yeah, so we're talking, muskets. we're talking Napoleonic times. So so this is still swords and stuff, right? Well, there's a mix of guns and swords. So cannons guns and, and guns and swords. Both America, Also, we're talking American Revolutionary War time, aren't we? Hmm. 
So think red coats and muskets and cannon and horses. There's and some sabers. pomp and circumstance to war at this point, isn't there still? Well, I think this is where it's potentially a little bit different down in South America because, like I say, there's, there's a lot of guerrilla action going on. These guys, a lot of the guys that are being used in the battles are these gauchos and sort of rural people. And by guerrilla action, we mean small scale... Skirmishing, s- strike and run. Strike and run type stuff yeah. rather so than big battles on a battlefield. Huge set piece battles aren't really a thing. That's why this... Gotcha. This Battle of the Stones, the Las Piedras, is still only a thousand people, a tenth of the size of what's going on. Well, it's just you were talking about Napoleon, right? The Battle of Waterloo and, and those things, where that certainly was the case. And you had your, yeah, your everyone men lines up, up and shoots at each other and, and your red jackets or your blue coats. And, yeah, I, I think there was an element of that, but it seems to be less so. I'm yeah. not a, a huge expert on it, but... Okay. So what's happened? Just to recap, uh, he's won the battle, which means he's free to siege Montevideo. And then he's doing pretty well, but then Buenos Aires make a truce and let the Spanish keep Montevideo for oh, various reasons. The reason being, what happens is the guy who's holding Montevideo turns to the Brazilians, and specifically the Portuguese in Brazil, and says, come and help me. And okay. the people of Argentina are more worried about being swept away by a Brazilian, Portuguese and Brazilians than they are about having or not having Montevideo specifically. So they come to an agreement. Okay. But this really irks Artigas. He's not happy with this at all. But that's okay because this uh, is a very fragile truce. And a couple of years later in 1813, he's back sieging Montevideo again. Okay. So what, I mean, what's he going to hoping to get this time? Uh, it's the same problem. They're trying to get uh, just trying to get the, to land. Get the Spanish out get and Spanish have out. it part of independent Rio de la Plata. Why can't we all just get along? Well, this we is shared it. We're, we're, we're just nibbling the edge of how long these fighting goes on for. Mm. So the second siege of Montevideo, and by which I mean Artigas's second siege, because the Brits have sieged and everyone else has sieged it before. One of the many sieges of uh, Is anybody Montevideo, winning, though, in these sieges? It fluctuates. It really goes back and forth a lot. Okay. So people are t- exchanging keys. But this one, Artigas wins this one for sure, and he, uh, the city surrenders to him. Cool. So now Buenos Aires is back in control. But Artigas isn't really happy with this either. So we've got this independent Rio de la Plata, which is this huge area that combines Argentina and Uruguay. Yeah. But what Artigas wants is to create, he creates, in fact, along with a bunch of other people, the League of Free People. And that's Sounds basically cool. the provinces who want not a super centralized Buenos Aires is in charge of everything kind of experience. They want a federated existence. So they want to be part of one, a sort of an EU kind of situation. So lots of independent-ish places, but part of a governed whole. Okay. Whereas what Buenos Aires wants is to be in charge of everything all the time. Of course. So that annoys Buenos Aires. Now they're kind of annoyed with Artigas. This is all part of this back and forth as various people get annoyed with each other. And this uh, is all happening in within what period? So like we're talking 50 years? So we're into years? 1814 now. We're certainly within the life of Artigas. Who's, yeah, uh, so that's what I'm saying. So less than 50 years, this is all happening. Yeah, for sure. So he was born, what? Well, yeah, we're talking 20 years, I think, at this point. So this is all happening within a 20-year period. Yeah, it looks that way. Wow, okay. So it's quite intense. Yeah, for sure. But again, it's sort of small scale as well. It's not like endless grinding war. It's skirmishes and battles and... Death by a thousand and, cuts. Well, maybe. Uh, but uh, so, so Artigas is, is said, yeah, I'm going to be part of this League of Free People. So Buenos Aires are annoyed. So then what happens next is the Portuguese and Brazil, uh, Brazilians, and I use the two interchangeably because during this period, Brazil actually becomes independent as well. So I'm just going to say Brazil, which you can take to mean oh, may well. include Portuguese. <laughs> So Brazil uh, invades, basically. And Buenos Aires, who would normally be the people who help out, because they're peed off with Artigas, just go, no, all right, we'll, we'll watch. And they do nothing. So okay. you've got little, essentially, Uruguay against mm. the gigantic mass of Brazil. Not going to go well. Artigas gets a pretty severe hammering. But it, uh, this speaks to this guy's spirit. So whilst he was losing to the Portuguese, he declared war on Buenos Aires. <laughs> Wait, what? So he's on in a fight yeah. with the mass of Brazil yeah. and decides that's not enough. He wants more he's enemies. He's so fed up that Buenos Aires aren't helping him. He declares war on them. <laughs> it's a bold move. It's a very bold move. Let's see how it works out for him. He loses. That's how it plays. <laughs> okay. right. He basically uh, has to withdraw to Paraguay in September 1820, where he just lives in exile until the day he dies in 1850. Where's Paraguay? Paraguay is sort of up and to the left. Brazil is to the north and Argentina is to the southwest. Right. Northwest. Inland? Sort of up there. Yeah, a little bit inland. Okay. So basically he's lost and he had to run away. <laughs> it's the, wow. the long and the short of it. Okay. 
So in Paraguay, he lives in exile uh, until he dies. Uh, now, it is said that Artigas, when he felt himself near death, asked for a horse and died in the saddle as a gaucho should. Nice. He died. He... I want to die in this chair behind this mic. Behind the mic. Exactly. That's yeah. how we're both going out. I feel Possibly a little tonight. dead anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying from the inside out. I yes. don't know about you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the one uh, interesting postscript to Artigas's life is uh, he continues to travel. His remains were buried in Paraguay. Uh, but then in 1855, he gets exhumed and his rem- remains are repatriated. By him? The but government, people. I guess. Okay. The people. So then he arrives to the port of Montevideo where he's then... <laughs> he stays in apparently the island of Liberty. I don't know where that is, but uh, he's stuck there for 13 months. So I think he gets stuck in customs in some for a manner month. <laughs> for 13 months. 13 months. Yeah. Okay. But then in 18, he gets reinterned at the Pantheon Nacional. But then again in 1977, he gets moved again. <laughs> wow. Okay. So they build an Artigas mausoleum in the center of the Plaza Independencia in Montevideo. And they transferred his remains in June 1977 over there. And that is where he resides to this day. Uh, And interesting fact, he is currently sitting at number 84 of 246 things to do in Montevideo, according to TripAdvisor. Okay, 86. (laughs) 86 86 on my list. Oh, no, 84, sorry. 84, sorry, is to go and see his his bowl. Go see. I mean, that's kind of a week three activity, isn't it, at best? (laughs) Hello, is this the Lost Property Office? Yes, sir. How can I help? Well, it's a bit embarrassing, really. You see, well, I'm travelling to Montevideo to inter the remains of my grandfather, and, well, you see, I put them down, because, well, bones are surprisingly heavy, and the next thing I know, well, they're gone. Oh, lost bones, is it? Not to worry, sir. Everything ends up here. We'll have Grandad back in no time. Oh, that's that's reassuring. Really, really great to hear. OK, well, I'll fetch the bone box. The The bone box? There you go, mate. Take a look, see if he's in there. I'm, I'm sorry, what? Well, if we've got him, he'll be in the bone box. But there's several skulls in here. Ooh, more than that, sir. At least a dozen people in there, I reckon. Oh, maybe even a dog. Well, well, then how on earth am I supposed to identify him? Not recognising anyone then, sir? Well, no. OK, well, we do have a form that might help you out a bit. Uh, question one. How many bones did your grandfather have? Well, I don't know. The, the, the normal amount. OK, I'll put down normal. Uh, Question two. What size was his skull? How would I know that? Well, how big was his hat? Look, I, I just can't... I'll put normal. Uh, question three is limbs. I've got to tick one, two, three, or four. Four. And evenly sized, or was he wonky at all? I, I'm really sorry. I'll put I'm normal. Just... I'll put normal. This isn't helping. Okay, well, look, how about this? How about we go through the box together and see what you recognise? So, what about this pelvis? Did he have childbearing hips, would you say? No. Uh, what about this finger? Maybe this rib ringing a bell? No, look, these all look the same. I don't know anything about what my grandfather's bones looked like. Well, did they have any distinguishing marks, scars or tattoos? No, he didn't have any tattoos on his bones. See, you do know something about what his bones look like. Look, this is ridiculous. I can't believe you'd just dump all the people's bones into one box and ask me to pick out my grandfather piece by piece. Oh, come on, mate. It's not that bad. We could be sieving through the Lost Ashes box. Now we're going to have a short interval because I want to tell you what happened to Uruguay. And this is the Cisplatine War or how to accidentally become a country. Right, so Brazil beat uh, our man Artigas. So Brazil now owned Banda Oriental, essentially. But then this group of people called the 33 Orientals. Mm-hmm. It's a bit like a Kung Fu movie. It does. These are rebels who include a guy called Fructuoso Rivera. Awesome name. They go over to Banda Oriental from Buenos Aires to resist Brazilian rule. And they declare their independence and claim allegiance back to Rio de la Plata, so the Argentine side. So they want to rejoin the Argentines. So it's a big war, basically. Five years of war. Nobody wins. In 1828, the British and French, who kind of want to use these ports that are all blocked up by war, say, that's it, we've had enough. They pressure the guys to make peace and they both sign the Treaty of Montevideo. And what that did was it acknowledged the independence of the area under under the name the Eastern Republic of Uruguay. What does Uruguay mean? Oh, Uruguay's a river, I think. Okay, within Uruguay. So basically what they did was they created a buffer nation between Argentina and Brazil 
that was its own country to just stop this rowing between the two. But it was weird because it was a nation that was created without anybody really asking for it. Nobody was pressing for an independent Uruguay, and yet it was just made for political reasons to create, like I say, this buffer area between the the conflicted Argentines and the Brazilians. So who made it? Essentially, the British and the, the British and the French stepped created, in. Said stepped in and said, right, you're going to have peace now. Okay. Uh, and like here's our suggestion. There's a guy called John Ponsonby, as a matter of fact, who nice. was a British uh, negotiator, diplomat. Who I'd love it if his name was John Uruguay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we're going to call it. <laughs> now, John Ponsonby, uh, who interestingly did the same thing when he created Belgium. He created two same, countries. Yeah, he did the same thing. He, yeah, he, I guess he, he repeated the trick twice. Wow, that's amazing. But that's why I call Full it name Hatsby. John Belgium Uruguay. Yeah. <laughs> Ponsonby. <laughs> he never got round to naming country John. <laughs> but I just thought that was interesting because there was never a group of people who said, we want a nation called Uruguay and we push it. Because everywhere we've seen, they have had independence movements who've wanted to be yeah. a nation. But Uruguay just kind of happens. No one asked for it, but it was created. Now we've got a nation. That's amazing. Uh, The first president of Uruguay was Fructuoso Rivera, that chap who was one of the 33 Orientals who went over to stir up trouble. Fructose. Isn't that a sugar? Yes, it is. I guess he was a very sweet man. Uh... Yeah, he really wasn't, which you're about to find out in death number three, the Charuas, death of an entire people. Oh, okay. Death in Uruguay, number three, the death of an entire people. Hold on to your hats, people. Exactly. Do you remember the Charuas? I do, the the, uh, cannibals. Exactly. Not cannibals. Well... Maybe cannibals, we don't know. Well, there's, there's a really valid question, actually, which we'll come to in a second. But yeah, they were blamed for killing the first European. Yes. So an observer described these people as <laughs> the athletic cut and balance of the muscular masses makes the pampido, which is a Spanish word for a South American native, makes the pampido one of the most superb models of the human organism. Wow. Wow, indeed. That's a sexy statement. It's fanfic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so but I hate them. I hate them so much. They're all I think about. I hate them so much. Late at night when I'm alone in my room, I hate them. Fifty Shades of Uruguay. (laughs) So these guys started out living okay with the Europeans, uh, but then the European population increased and the Europeans start to spread. This is a familiar story from pretty much everywhere. They are a virus. Yes, they spread and the Churros are not happy on this, so they start attacking settlements. I mean, I get it. Yes. I get it, but... It's not okay. It's not going to win well, is it? So Fructuoso Rivera... Mm. Uh, discovers about this uh, and he goes straight to level 10 in his reaction which is genocide literal planned genocide okay so in 1831 he organized organized a campaign a deliberate campaign of genocide known as la campaña de salsipuedes that sounds more fun than it probably is well how about if i translate it for you see how fun this sounds cool the campaign of get out if you can Wow, really? Sal is to so leave, see if puedes, if you can. Get leave out if you can. if you can. Now, Sal San Puedes <laughs> is actually a place. I couldn't figure out if it was named after Amazing. the massacre or the massacre happened to take place in a super creepy named location. But when this stuff happens, is it like split down the middle? Like we're so used to politics these days where everything's sort of like 48, 51% when things get voted on or when they're discussed. Like does everyone at this stage be like, yeah, we should total genocide. Or is it still... Spe- are there, like, people going, you know what, well, that sounds bonkers. Let's not do that. I think generally there was an agreement that Europeans were superior to everybody else. So I suspect there wasn't that kind of... Well, there may a have difference been some between that and... Killing everyone. Killing it more. Well, yeah. I, well, I certainly saw no signs of anyone disagreeing with this. No. But it was a military affair. So it starts with a betrayal, obviously. So the president, our man Fructuoso Rivera, he knew the tribal leaders, apparently... He called them to his barracks by the river, which I've got here was later named Salsi Puedes. So I guess that's uh, a result of the massacre. Anyway, he claimed he needed their help to defend the territory and they should join together. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And he, this is the stuff that I don't like about all this. Like if they just said, right, we're going to genocide and they just killed them all. 
But why do all this stuff, the double crossing and the lies and well, like, it just makes it so much more evil and evil and awful, right? Because not you, that it's not evil, but this is more evil. Yeah, it's worse, isn't it? Because it's like, come over, join us. He plies everyone with alcohol. Everyone gets drunk. Uh, and when they're drunk, the Amer- U- Uruguayan soldiers attack them and kill everyone. Wow. Then there are two subsequent attacks that are carried out deliberately to eliminate the remaining Churuas. So then the Churuas were officially claimed to be extinct. So Wow. That is literally the death, the deliberate and planned death of an entire people. It's so depressing, isn't it? I'm going to make it more depressing for you. There were four surviving Chirua who were captured at Salsi Puedes. Right. And the director of the Oriental School of Montevideo thought, this is interesting. Let's send them to appear as part of a human zoo in France. Do you know what? I was go- The word that popped into my head when you said there was four left, I thought zoo. That's Turns out... Happened. You're absolutely right. Yep. And really tragically, the display was not successful and they all died. Wait. Okay. There's two things there. The display was not successful. What? I guess they didn't draw in the punters. Oh, I thought you meant like, you know, they didn't give them enough air or they weren't oh, enough no. food. <laughs> no, or... no, no. They, I guess they, it wasn't popular uh, and they all died. I think it was within a year. And that was it. And that was the end and of that them. Was, that was it done. So wow. these people, but there is a, a little bit of a slightly more upbeat postscript. So... There is a, um, a sculpture called Los Ultimos Charuas in their memory in Montevideo today, which mm. you can go and see. In 2002, the remains of one of those four guys was ret- were returned to Uruguay. Mm. And so is this the end of the Charua? Yes and no. <gasps> Genetics and Jurassic Park. Now, almost. In one... Well, not at all, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> I've given you too much credit there. So in one sense, now today, all Uruguayans consider themselves... Charua. Now, this comes from a bunch of people on the uh, Reddit, subreddit, R Uruguay. So this is a few people I talked to. So this isn't a super scientific survey, but this is what I was getting across was everyone is a little bit Charua. Which sounds like a song. They refer to themselves as Charua in the context of a sort of a competition or sporting event. So football teams would be referred to as Charua. It's a term used in conversation when someone's faced with insurmountable obstacles. It's a sort of courage in the face of adversity phrase. Who's remembering them? Sorry, I'm I'm a little bit all, confused. All Uruguayans now. Because of this? I guess, yeah. I mean, you'd think that them being wiped out, Isn't they wouldn't be remembered. The <laughs> no, they are. But so, yeah, they, they, they've they kind of been absorbed. They've got an expression called gara charua, which is chiruan tenacity, which is refers to that sort of, again, that sort of tenacity in the face of overwhelming odds. I mean, this is incredible. When, when, uh, when was the genocide? 170, 190 years ago. Yeah. They're still remembered, like, uh, fondly? Yeah, I think it's, from what I can make out, and again, you're talking about a few people talking, it's, oh, we're all, they, they, as a nation, they are, come from, everyone comes from a lot of backgrounds, so everyone's a bit of various things. And there's the Chirua is, is a Uruguayan thing that is purely Uruguayan, I guess they, they yeah. perceive it as. But there is also a more literal sense of the survival of these people. So there are now groups of people who claim to be descendants of Chirua. Now, there was a okay. bit of debate on the the Reddit that I was at, but there is an organization called Kanacha, which is the Council of the Chirua Nation. And uh, a, a nice Reddit user called Sir Chivo, he got in touch with me and he translated with me with a guy called Martin Delgado Cultelli, uh, who is a uh, representative of the this organization. And he explained to me, because I was kind of confused, like, how do you identify yourself with the people that's gone, gone, gone obliterated, yeah. right? So essentially, they, they rather than saying we are Chiruan people, they, they see themselves as descendants of the Chiruan. So they're not, I am a Chiruan. They're like, I, in some ways, I came from Chiruan stock. And the way you kind of think that is through your family stories and oral tradition. So okay. in the same way as great, great granddad came over from Italy, you've got great, great grandma hid from the uh, Uruguayans during the massacres, yeah. I guess. Okay. So there's a kind of, or, the surviving oral culture is, there's some so of it still there. Is, is it a scientific descendant or is this much more of a sort of symbolic descendant? So they, they don't have any, they don't require DNA tests. Uh, there are no pure blood Chirua and they don't claim to be pure Chirua okay. at all. So the, there's no one out there that's getting a people. DNA test and being like, well, actually, there no, is No, so some. there's no DNA requirement to join gotcha. the organisation. It's a it's a cultural survival organisation. Okay. So the, what they do is they try and uh, piece together, I guess, the, the various traditions, the instruments, the, they've got the kind of pan pipes, mm. the clothing, the style of clothing, the skills that they had. Okay. So it's just this attempt to kind of re- re-piece together a culture that is... Oh, that's amazing. To, ...to a large part completely gone. And it's like they don't pretend, yes, I'm kind of a hipster truer, but 
they are they are trying to bring the, the what's left of the language together, what's left of the styles of clothing, like I say, and also sort of make raise awareness with a bit of political type of action. Well, that's that is uh, a positive t- turn to that story. I wasn't expecting that. It is. Uh, it was there was some because they could have easily have been just sort of relegated to the history books and that's it. Yeah, it could easily have just been nothing. Yeah, but they, they there is some efforts to keep what is what remains, and everyone acknowledges. You will never get back this whole culture. There are no truer left in the truest sense. But no. this is an attempt to just keep that whatever threads of the culture are left alive. And what I like about that is that whoever that guy was who had that plan for leave if you can, he may have won in quotes in the short term, but long term, he but didn't. It, and it raises a lot of questions about a culture, a culture then. So how there is now, because there are no pure Chirua left anywhere. I mean, who is to say what is and isn't Chirua culture? Hmm. I, 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 and that's a, that's a genuine question. I don't know. How do you know, you know, your granny had this style of weaving, I guess, that she taught you and your mum taught you. That's what and you can share that. Stories and things, yeah. But you can never really know what it was really like, but you can do what you can, can't you? What I'm curious about here, though, is... The cannibals that were hanging around with these guys at the same time. Because oh, I suspect that they they were getting a bit hot under the collar watching their fellow natives being slaughtered. Yeah, I don't know what happened to them, to be honest with you. This was all Probably about hiding the, uh, the bones of those people that they did. Like, no sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nothing to do with us. <laughs> But I'm going to take you on a little diversion for death number four. This is a chap called Horatio Quiroga. Uh, I'm going to call him the man death could not leave alone. Death in Uruguay. Number four. The man death could not leave alone. So this guy was born in 1878. This is Uruguay settling down. When he was two and a half months old, his father accidentally fired a gun he was carrying and died. But the, our boy grows up into a bit of a writer in 1899. He's about 19. He founds a magazine called Revista de Salto. Uh, that also is the year his stepfather commits suicide by shooting himself. Oh. Yeah, Quiroga witnessed the death. Right. So both his father and his stepfather shot themselves. Yes, one accidentally and one deliberately. I mean, at that point, you've got to start looking at him, haven't you? Well, things get... <laughs> I mean, like, yes, I know you're always banging on about me with this is not conspiracies, a... <laughs> but now like, I would be, I would have that little prickle on the back of my neck when that kid was around. You hold that thought, sir. Okay. Because uh, in 1901, he publishes his first book called Coral Reefs. Called How to Shoot Somebody yeah, and yeah. Get Away With It. <laughs> Nobody, it wasn't me, the uh, Kuroga story. No, Kuroga publishes his first book, Coral Reefs, right? This is slightly overshadowed Coral by Reefs. Coral Reefs, yeah. About Coral Reefs. No, it's the name of the book. About coral reefs. I don't know what it's about, Ryan. <laughs> well, no, but why is it called coral reefs? I don't know. Why is anything called anything? Okay. It just right. seems like a very peculiar <laughs> thing to call your book. Like cowboys or something. I get it. Or, you know, long lost tribes of Uruguay. Do you want to hear about this, man? <laughs> just intrigued why it's called coral reefs. It just seems really peculiar. Well, it's published. It's out. You can buy, buy a copy and let me know All next right. week. But uh, this is slightly overshadowed because this is also the time two of his sisters die of typhoid fever. If you'd have said being shot accidentally. <laughs> well, funny you should say that because this is also the year his friend gets a bad review from a Montevideo journalist. So his friend challenges the journalist to a duel. Nice. Right. So Kiroga, worried about his friend's safety, offers to check and clean the gun that was to be used. His friend's gun. His friend's gun. Because oh, okay. he's worried about his friend's safety. Of course he is, yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. I'm going to let you guess what happens next. His gun doesn't go off. No, while inspecting the weapon, he accidentally fires a shot, hits his friend in the mouth, killing him instantly. In the mouth? In the mouth. No, no. Right? Killing him instantly. Yeah. So racked with grief, grief and guilt, he moves to Argentina from Uruguay to live with one of his sisters. You don't clean a gun pointing it at your friend. I'm sorry. With a bullet in it even, you might say. Why is he killing his friend? Well, he didn't accidentally, right? He's this guy, everyone's dying around him. Just the journalist who he was now a jewel just stands around being like, so I win. <laughs> I guess I win. I think that's a buy in <laughs> dueling terms. <laughs> wow. Right. So he's left the country. He's like, I can't take this. He goes to Buenos Aires, publishes another book called, this is going to make you laugh, The Crime of Another. <laughs> no way. This is ridiculous. 
but then he works for the next two years on a multitude of stories, uh, many about rural terror, but others were, quote, delightful stories for children. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, have you ever read any children's stories from, like, beyond 100 years ago? They were all They're quite creepy, terrifying. Yeah, right? Well, so in 1970, he writes another horror story called The Feather Pillow, which is published by a famous Argentinian magazine that also then published eight more of his stories later. But he becomes famous, is the long and the short of it. Okay. Uh, so things are looking up, but he decides he wants to return to the jungle. He buys a farm in the jungle in the province of Misiones and gets right. a job as a teacher. Uh, now, creepily, he falls in love with one of his teenage students and oh, goes on no. to marry her. Uh, and they have kids and they raise them in the jungle. How many does he shoot in the face? Well, he doesn't need to because he's got another methodology. Okay. So he clearly doesn't want to be happy, this guy. But basically, they have a very volatile relationship. They have arguments and this disturbs his wife. She becomes severely depressed. After a big fight with the writer, she ingests a faithful, fatal dose of mercury chloride. Yeah, she does this. Sure she does. Well, she does. And this doesn't kill her instantly. No, she gets eight days of agony before she dies in her husband's arms in 1915. Now, you talked about all everyone being men so far. He totally poisoned her. You can, we can come to that later. But what astonished me was this death of his wife, who was, as far as I can make out, driven to suicide by her horrible relationship with this guy, is presented as another tragedy for this writer. Like, yeah. Well, what about her? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, the poor writer. Like, he drove her nuts, as yeah, far yeah, as I yeah. can make out. So he, he continues to write stories. He writes uh, <laughs> a book called Tales of Love, Madness and Death which is a huge success. Uh, it then follows that with, um, uh, unexpectedly, a book of children's stories called Jungle Tales. Sounds fun. Right? Moves back to the jungle, he marries again. Uh, then he's in 1935, when he's about 56, 57, he starts to feel a bit unwell and he's got prostate hypertrophy. What's that? Uh, I don't know. Hello. This is the voice of the internet. Prostatic hypertrophy, or prostate gland enlargement is a common condition among older men where a small gland near the bladder grows larger than usual. This is due either to emergence of cancer or an overgrowth of tissue. The enlarged prostate pushes against the urethra and bladder, blocking the flow of urine. If left untreated, the prostate can eventually become large enough that it can lead to urinary infections or bladder and kidney damage. If left completely untreated, prostate enlargement can result in death. If you are experiencing urinary problems, please discuss them with your doctor. Thank you. Uh, now his wife leaves him, unwell, in the jungle. She caught him trying to kill her, so she He's like, it. have a drink of this. Like, mm. It's smoking, darling, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> so he goes off to hospital. Now, in the emergency ward, he learns there's also a patient in the hospital, in the hidden in the basin, who had similar deformities to John Merrick. Okay, the elephant man. The elephant man, yes. And he says, I can't have that. I insist that you take him out and he can stay in my room with me. So they become buddies, him and his sort of elephant man type character. Wow, okay. So then in 1937, he says to his friend, I can't take this pain anymore, glugs himself a glass of cyanide, and after a couple of minutes of unbearable pain, he dies. Right. Well, that must have cheered up that guy. It was his roommate. He's like, well, now I've lost the guy who was looking out (laughs) for me. Back to the basement. (laughs) I guess so, right? (laughs) (laughs) So he didn't really hang out or do do a lot of good for anyone, apart from this brief moment with this guy, I guess. I may be horribly mischaracterizing (laughs) that. He put him in the basement. Right, it's terrible, isn't it? Ugh. But uh, what's interesting is, so this guy is really well known in Uruguay, apparently. He, the kids... Which one? The, the writer. Okay. They read his stories in school, the, the people on Reddit were telling me. Uh, he's, he's well, everyone knows who he is. Uh, he's creepy stories, apparently, perhaps right. unsurprisingly, compared to Poe a lot. I was going to say Edgar Allan Poe, so it just sounds... He, he acknowledges that Poe was a real influence on him. But yeah, so he lived through what was a relatively stable time for Uruguay, but it just goes to show what's stable for the country may not be stable for you, the individual. He doesn't sound stable. Not at all. I have not actually read any of these yet, because unfortunately I was doing research, but I plan to read at least one of them, because they're... His short stories were apparently the, the thing you really want to look out for. So, right. Uh, thank you, everyone who told me about this. You say short stories, I say autobiographical murders. <laughs> <laughs> Fictional confessions. <laughs> hey, Pete. Hey, Ryan. Hey, um, I finished the novel. I finally finished it. Oh, that's great news. That means you must have picked a title then. I did, yeah. I went for the excruciating and horrendously awful death of one Peter Goddard. Oh, man, that is an amazing title. Whoa, yeah, wait, whoa, good. whoa. Peter Goddard, that's me. What do you mean, you? I mean, that's my name. Well, no, it's just a name, right? I just had to pick a name, so I just, I guess I went with something familiar. Oh, uh, no, okay, I see yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it's probably <laughs> quite a common name. So what's it yeah. about then, anyway? Um, right, well, it's about these two podcast hosts, and uh, one so of like them is... So like our podcast? Well, 
yeah, I mean, look, it, I mean, it's a podcast. There are two million podcasts in the world, right? I mean, yeah, <laughs> not true. all of the podcasts. Yeah, not everything revolves around you, Pete. Yeah, um, no, no, I get it. No, it's, I mean, anyone can do a podcast, can can't they? Right. Like, you so, can just get a mic. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so anyway, so there's this, there's this this guy, and he's doing the podcast, and he's you know, it's a good looking guy, and the other guy's getting really frustrated by him. He's, he's just well, why is he getting frustrated? He's really, well, he keeps on interrupting him. Well, yeah, that would be annoying. Yeah, he just keep like he's trying to talk, and the other guy keeps just on talking over him. Talk, he talks over. Him, I mean, that yeah. would really wind you up, wouldn't it? Right. I'd be like, oh, yes, yeah, it's exactly like that. So, uh, so he waits into this dark, rainy night. And so kind of like, I mean, it's like tonight where all the rain's coming on the window and it's yeah. all yeah, spooky, you know, yeah, like you real picture. horror, sort of thriller stuff. That's just, great. Just like tonight, yeah. And so he waits until he's out in the street and he follows him down the street. Is there anywhere specific? He's, he's just any street or do uh, you know? Just picture like a street outside, yeah, outside here. And then uh, he's got a knife in his hand. And well, like that, that one you're holding now? Yeah, yeah, I mean, a bit like this one, yeah. I mean, I mean it's a big knife. Well, it's just a pen knife, right? Oh, this looks like a boning knife, if anything. Well, I mean, boning knife, pen knife, whatever you want. Anyway, he uh, anyway, so he follows him down the street, jumps on his back, stabs him to death, just five hundred times, just again and again, just furious, just oh, I hate you so much, uh, Ryan. Yeah. Is this about me? No, no. I, I said he was good looking. Oh yeah. So now, I'm going to move on to death number five. Oh, I feel like we're coming to the end of the, the death. The final death. When will death never end? Death, thou shalt die. Uh, Dan Mitrioni, or I have entitled this chapter, How to Die of Irony. Okay. Death in Uruguay. Number five. How to Die of Irony. So moving into the 60s, we start to get a lot of problems and a bit of leftist resistance comes up. And this is where we see a group called the Tupamaros be created. The supermarkets? The Tupamaros. Supermarcos. Tupamaro. Tupamarcos. Tupa, well, I'll make this easy for you. They're um, named after Tupac Amaru II. Uh, Tupac. Tupac Amaru is also the name, the origin of the name Tupac Shakur, of course. Nice. So Tupamaros, now you remember it, mm. uh, they were founded by a guy called Raoul Sendik. And they started off just robbing banks and businesses and they'd buy food and money and take the money and distribute it to the poor. Robin Hoods. Exactly. They were Robin Hood stylies. They had a slogan, either everyone dances or no one dances. What does that mean? That means it's going to be fair or I'm going to make this horrible for everyone. Okay. When would they say this? Well, I would imagine they put it on their flyers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I was just wondering if, like, you know, when they were robbing a bank or something, they came in, they're like... And they shout that, yeah. just so you know who, it was, who like, it was you're dealing with. <laughs> what does that mean? Like, it doesn't I matter. Know, I don't just, want to dance. It's our, it's our slogan. <laughs> Caused a lot of debate. Got Made matters very confusing in various bank robberies. Yes. <laughs> okay. Right. We've got a plan. We've got the guns. Balaclava's on. We smash through the front doors, wave the guns in the air and shout, everybody get down. Hostages on the floor. Cashiers stuff the cash in a the bag. Then we leg it, shouting power to the people. And then we give the money to the poor. Yeah, yeah. Less expenses. Guns, balaclavas, getaway vehicle. Mind you, watch. Oh, and the T-shirts. T-shirts? Yeah, you said you wanted us to be better known. So I thought, to help us grow our brand identity, I, I thought I'd get us some T-shirts printed. You know, power to people across the chest. I just think it'll leverage our name recognition equity, you know. All right. Well, let's have a look. Uh, Jonesy. Why does this T-shirt say either everybody dances or nobody dances? Oh, no. Oh, well, that's not right. Oh, they've used the artwork for Gary's karaoke night. All right, forget the T-shirts. No, 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 no. We can still make this work. Um, I mean, the people, they love dancing. It, it hits all our main demographics. It's hip. It's now. It's wow. It, it's democratic. Everybody dances or nobody dances. How's that going to work then? We just bust in there wearing these, waving our guns in the air and shouting everybody get down? Yes, 
Yeah, yeah, waving our guns in the air like you just don't care. And then everybody gets down. The hostages are on the floor and we'll hot step it out of there. Everybody dances or nobody dances. I love it. All right, everybody get in position and a five and a six and a seven and a eight and a... All right. Everybody, get down! So at the start, it was, it was a non-violent group. It was a political group, non-violent. But the government then clamps down harder. In June 68, the president tries to suppress labour unrest and he enforces a state of emergency. He repeals all constitutional safeguards. So this is the picture we're in. You've got leftist growth of a leftist rebel kind of groups. You've got right-wing government clamping down on people. And this is where our man, Dan Mitrioni, arrives. Sorry, what year are we in? 1968. 1968, okay. So our man, Dan, is an American, and he works for the Office of Public Safety. Cool. Have you heard of the Office of Public Safety? Mm, No. No, this is a US government program that was established, and I'm going to put this in very big inverted commas, to provide police assistance to US allies. Why are you putting that in big quotes? I'm putting that in big quotes because what that means is teach the police how to torture people. Oh, wait. Well, how are you getting that? Because this is a front for CIA operatives and it is literally Dan Mitrioni's job to teach the Uruguayan police torture techniques. Uh, okay. And what was his job again? The something of safety? In the Office of Public Safety. How do you get torture from that? Or is it just like a cover? Well, it's a cover. <laughs> ah, Because okay. you don't normally arrive and go, we are the CIA Office of Torturing People. You come up with I mean, a it would nice be much black. clearer it if would it be was. Easier. I'd, I'd be like, oh, yeah, we're expecting you. I'm not expecting the safety people. So, so this guy is horrible, right? He starts out in Brazil, and I'll just give you the mildest of, of things that were going on there. He, he, they were using a thing called the refrigerator, a little black box which you would cram someone into. Mm. And it had flashing lights, his heat and cold settings and speakers, and it would alternate flashing and then darkness and cold and hot uh, until he went mad, basically. Wow. Uh, he also was known for a particularly nasty torture. He was known for using electricity to torture, mm-hmm. uh, and he was known for a, a particular version called the Statue of Liberty, of all things. Which means standing there with one arm in the air and one arm... More or less, you stand. I won't give the details because it's disgusting, but uh, it does involve standing up and falling down and being shocked with electric shocks. Wait, what? So you stand up, and if you fall down, you, you get, get shocked, shocked. So you stand up again, and you're standing on sardine tins, which are sharp. Ah, oh, yeah, nasty what? man, right? Come on. So that's what that's his life in Brazil. He moves in 1969. He comes to Uruguay, right? So this is the kind of guy we're dealing with. The first thing he does is set up a soundproof cellar in his house. <laughs> of course, he does, right? Uh, so this is his torture classroom. So uh, allegedly wow. he tested, then then he did his demonstrations on homeless people they captured and kidnapped. So they say... That had done nothing four... except be homeless. Yeah. Okay. So just to teach Uruguayans how to torture people, they kidnapped and uh, I guess ultimately killed four homeless people. Wow. And That's this is... insane. Oh, yeah, this is horrible, horrible stuff. Right? So we're... I mean, it's post-war, but it's... It's quite a while it's cold after war. war, it's, cold it's Cold War, war time. now time. Yeah. This is our man, Dan Mitrioni. He's arrived, he's teaching people how to torture. Uh, also at this time, the two Pomaros, they're up in the ante and they are now very much down with the violence. Uh, they did a thing called the Taking of Pando, which is a violent occupation of a city in Uruguay in 1969. Uh, and they also take to kidnapping. Now, their attention as kidnappers is drawn to Mr. Mitrioni. Oh, really? So on July 31st, 1970, the two Pomaros kidnapped Dan Mitrioni. Good. So during the kidnapping, he gets shot in the shoulder, but his kidnappers treat the wound and they demand the release of 150 political prisoners. Now, what do governments not do? Uh, They don't negotiate with terrorists. Correct. And they refuse to do anything. So they're... Oh, they actually held that. Yeah, they did. Because if I've seen 24 or any of those other TV shows, they're always... They always say we won't negotiate and then they just negotiate. No, they they hold out. They say, no, we're not going to do it. So this is where the irony comes in. Also, he's a jerk. So keep him. Well, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, maybe they were done with him. No. They've learned everything. So here's the irony, right? According to Raoul Sendik, this is the guy who founded the Tupamaros, the leadership of the Tupamaros had no intention of actually killing Mitrioni. Okay. But on August the 7th, 1970, a week after he was kidnapped, the Uruguayan police raid the house where the Tupamaro leaders are and they capture them all. Okay. They were living in a house. Well, everyone lives in a house. Yeah, I don't know why I thought they'd be up in a hill somewhere, <laughs> like in a camp. So, but that's okay, because there's a second replacement leadership, and they also know the plan to keep Mitrioni alive. Mm. But then they get captured as well. Oh, okay. So now, 
there's only one group of people who didn't know that the plan was to keep Dan Mitrioni alive, and that was the people who actually had Dan Mitrioni. Okay. So these guys, when the deadline came, the group that was left with Mitrioni didn't know what to do. So they just carried out the threat. They shoot him twice in the back of the head and dump him in a car. Wow. So basically, instead of being left alive and released, which would have happened had the leadership of the Tupamaros got what they wanted... Because the police who he'd been training were so effective right. catching the terrorists, he got shot in the head. Twice. Twice. Yeah. And that is how you die of irony. Double tap. Right? So now back in the US, this guy's been found, obviously. I'm, I'm not upset by that. No, me either, to be honest with you. Uh, but back in the US, they are, because the White House spokesman said that this man, Dan Mitrioni, exemplified the highest principles of the police profession, ah, yeah, yeah, that yeah, of yeah, social yeah. Whatever. service, Whatever. Uh, which would have been news to the homeless people he kidnapped and killed. Mm. Um, but the legacy of Mitrioni and his friends are they normalised torture and brutality in Uruguay for more than a decade. So after, The damage has been done, right? It's, it's not, oh, this is how you do things, right? So after the, the Tupamaras get defeated, but then the military seizes power in 1973, it becomes a dictatorship, and torture just becomes part of the mm. tools of government there. Uh, right up until the end of the Uruguayan dictatorship in 1985. Wow. So I'm going to give you a postscript and a bonus death, the death of the dictatorship. Okay. So in 1981, uh, General Alvarez assumes the presidency. Everyone's fed up. By 1984, there are huge protests. There's a 24-hour general strike, and it becomes clear that everyone's pretty ticked off so they go okay fair enough and they just have national elections in 1984 and julio maria sanguinetti becomes president in 1985 and since then things are looking up so uruguay is now ranked first in latin america in democracy peace and low perception of corruption it's the first in south america for press freedom the size of the middle class and prosperity the un regards it as a high income country and it's one of the most socially progressive countries in latin america and in 2013 the economist named uruguay country of the year based on what being good just being the best being a country yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i would imagine a range of indices of wealth of fairness and happiness very good oh, has there been any countries do you reckon that have held on to it what the country of the what year do you reckon they do yeah or do you reckon they just sort of pass it around i don't know. do you think they put it on all their uh their oh, merchandise wouldn't you? <laughs> country of the year 2013 you? of course you would yeah absolutely but that sir is the history of uruguay in five deaths blimey that's a lot of death. That was a lot of information there. You did well to keep up to me. No, honest. that's great. I, I mean, I'm still, there's, there's just so many things there. Like just one of those would have been enough for me to sort of take that away. But I'm I'm still stuck on the cannibals that weren't cannibals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the guy whose bones were carried across the world. I want my bones carried across the world. Ryan, I will carry your bones across the world. Mm, on your head. did you die first? Well, <laughs> Currently, you're carrying your bones across the world. <laughs> That's so true. You're doing a good job. Well, I'm not going anywhere at the moment. Yeah. No, I mean, Peter, that was fantastic. I really, 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 really enjoyed that. That took us all over Uruguay. I feel like I know it really well. Thank you very much. So I do have to thank the guys at our Uruguay. They were really helpful. It was a real challenge, I have to say. I didn't want to just come and say, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. So I was trying to dig into the, the, the people's stories that were underlying Absolutely. what was going on. Yeah, and I think we've got exactly that. I think it's cool. But as ever, uh, having researched Uruguay a bit, I now love it and want to go there. It's it's the problem. It's an occupational hazard. This isn't is it? the occupational hazard. <laughs> like we have twenty two countries that we need to go and visit now. <laughs> uh, no, this was fantastic. Well done, Pete. Um, so, okay, so I guess that brings us to the point where it's my turn it to is your turn. hit the Durs of Lace War and find out what I'm going to be researching for our next podcast. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start the Durs later now. And uh, I'm excited. I, I love this bit. This is my favorite bit where it's, I'm going to find out what my next two weeks is going to be. It's a world of possibilities, isn't it? And so, right, here we go. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. All right. And my place is East Timor. Ooh. Great. <laughs> so I was worried you were going to get West Timor for a moment there, but phew. Yeah, so I'm East just glad Timor. it's not North Timor. <laughs> East Timor. Okay. I think it's in Africa. Uh, it might be. I just, I've, I've realised that not, it's not that I don't know where it is. It's that I think I know some things about it. Oh, wow. Okay. 
Let's hit the time period. And the time period is... Okay, it is the classical era. That's 600 BC to AD 476. Ooh, that's another era. That's a long one. Yeah. Subject. The topic. Topic is... For you, I'm hoping for something quite broad, given the challenges already presented. <laughs> Timor between 600 BC and 476 AD. <laughs> okay, and the topic is order. 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 <laughs> Are you sure it's not hors d'oeuvres? No, it's no. definitely order. <laughs> so order is in law and order? Well, it's up to you, isn't it? Order. Putting things in order. Yeah, just come in do an alphabet of things. <laughs> I'm nervous about this one, Pete. East Timor, 600 BC to 476 in order. See, whereas I'm not nervous, I'm just glad it's not me. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know you're not nervous. Oh, I'm sweating a little bit. Well, okay. You're be all right. You'll well, be fine. Order. Order's easy. I wouldn't wish this on my worst Portuguese colonist. <laughs> you know those buggers have gone in, don't you? <laughs> okay, well, that's the show for this week. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to get in touch about any of the things we've talked about in this episode, you we can be found on Twitter at, at HHE Podcast, or you can email us at HHE Podcast at gmail.com. You never know, you might end up featured on a future show. Now, you can definitely feature on a future show if you rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts. Uh, in the meantime, you can find and join discussions about the show on Facebook and Reddit. Uh, again, HHE Podcast. So make sure to subscribe to those as well as Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of those. It's still HHE Podcast. <laughs> where a hit, a hit of history happened everywhere will appear in your feed every single day. Every day. And you know what? We'll be back again very soon with another episode. But in the meantime, if you haven't had enough, you might want to look out for The Verdict. Uh, which is our after show podcast where Paul Dursley, our judge, jury and executioner will join us to rate and review and grade our efforts on this particular podcast. Now, if all that isn't enough, we also have a growing archive of old shows, which you can download and listen to whenever you want. You can find those on YouTube, your podcast provider or at hhepodcast.com. That's right. So all that's needed to be said now is you've been listening to... History happened everywhere. My little thing. I have often been... Welcome to history (laughs) happened everywhere. There's no history here. I was born in it. In history. (laughs) That's my Tom Hardy impression. Oh my lord. Are you a merely sheep? I, I, the, the mask is... I don't even know what he says. <laughs> <laughs> I want to change my answer. I want to be Patrick Stewart. Patrick Stewart? Yeah. You just want me to do impressions now. A little bit of that, yeah. Welcome to history. History happened everywhere. Number Here one. Kellen. <laughs> yeah, that was a little bit, wasn't it? <laughs> you shall not pass. Well, to anyone studying for their exams, <laughs> using history happened everywhere. We have a message. <laughs> Uh, let me do it as Patrick Stewart. Let me see if I can do the intro as Patrick Stewart. History happened everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know who I do a really good impression of? Go on. It's, you know, Family Guy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know who Peter's... <laughs> you know Peter's neighbour? I do. The one who's in a wheelchair? Yeah. I do a really good impression of him. I would like to hear that. <laughs> would you? <laughs> what would you like him to say? I don't know. Maybe my name? His name's Joe, right? Yeah. Hey, I could do the, your name. All right, that's easy. Peter. Right? <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> Just sound like you've got asthma. Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to history. Happen everywhere. You sound like a sultry asthmatic. <laughs> 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 well, you can use any of this. No, none of this. <laughs> <laughs>